When I'm on stage, I, I feel like a totally different person, you know? I feel like I'm, I'm with some sort of higher power, you know? I'm able to do things that I would not be able to do in a, just a normal state. I've returned home from USA. I've been in there over there for 10 years, you know? I mean, to find new ways to be home. You know, what does home mean? Uh, how can I uh, participate and inject myself back into my family? They've been waiting, like, you know, for me to return. It's hard to come back and notice that chunk of time you missed out on, you know, because you see change. But, you know, once you're there, you're sharing the air, you sort of catch up, it's like nothing's changed, but it has really, eh? Yeah, so having to find new ways to be home. And one of those new ways is performing or, or creating this dance that I'm doing called Mere Mere, the solo work, which is a biography around my journey. Not only life, but mainly like about my, my journey in the USA on the streets. It is therapeutic, you know, to revisit those emotions and feelings and memories and build some sort of clarity around why and, and, and what happened then. I was on the street for three years and then I returned home in 2015. There is heaps of material <laughs> here for a show and it is a solo. Yeah. Uh, and it is about you. Little did I know that, that all the, the stuff, you know, that I was going through at that time would evolve into something so beautiful or, you know, be um, shaped into something that sort of really has strong significance in relationship to, like, the, the thing I love the most, which is dance. I think we forget sometimes that your reality or my reality is very different someone else's reality and we, we have to, we have to share those things. Well, Rodney and I, uh, we met, gosh, um, maybe in 1999. We'd always talked about doing something independently together and then when he came back, I sort of contacted him to sort of work on a piece and I had no knowledge of what experiences he'd been through. So when we got together and he started telling me about these things, it sort of just unraveled that that was going to be the work. When I was homeless on the streets of San Francisco, I used to sleep on a park bench. I remember out of the morning bog used to fall this one-legged seagull, which I named Moana. Okay. Yeah, so that will take you back as the red comes through here and you hear that chant or the call. And then you'll end up here. Dance gave me a new way to relate to my body. Yeah, because as a dancer, you obviously got to really look after yourself physically. But I feel this idea of uh, being disabled is you just sit still and you stretch what you can feel and then everything else is sort of just hangs around. But dance sort of gave me this uh, new way of seeing and being in relationship to the, the parts of my body I didn't feel. I had my accident in 1991. I had a motorcycle accident. And uh, Obviously, I was drunk. Yeah, and didn't take a bend and went through a fence. And yeah, sure, I broke my back, but I, I broke a lot of people's hearts as well, you know, my family, friends. And I'm not proud. I'm not proud, but. And I'm not saying I'm paying the price either, but I'm just telling the truth about it. I was quite physical before I had my accident. And after my accident, I, 
yeah, I just had this new vessel I had to deal with. You just go toileting and these simple things that came pretty easy that we sort of forget about. Or well, not forget about, that we sort of... Not, I wouldn't say take for granted because you don't know things take for granted until they're taken away, right? On the chest down, I had lost all feeling and control. And I had damaged my shoulder as well, which needed reconstruction. Sure, I went through times of challenge, and there were different stages, like uh, in relationship to what my, my new future would look like and what sort of a career I'm going to be able to pursue. I reckon my mind sort of opened up even more after I had my injury. I started getting steered into these new places. I sort of just jumped in the hour in the river and, and thought, wow, well, where's this going to take me? And then the last one is that back wall, and you just you just swipe. How's it going? Good. The seed of dance first got planted in me by a lady named Catherine Chappelle, who's the artistic director for Touch Compass Dance Trust. I first met her back in the 90s, and she came in and showed a video to the uh, junior wheelchair basketball team that I was coaching at that time. I sat back and, and admired and, and had a giggle, I must admit, because it was a new, yeah, it was sort of a new energy for me. And then she wanted to bring me out into the space and, and sort of demonstrate a few movements with me. And I found, that, I found that sort of like a little bit, you know, a little bit weird at that time. Yeah, and then uh, the relationship grew between her and I and, uh, to dance. Yeah, and then it evolved really quickly. And I remember the first time uh, moving in front of a crowd of people. Yeah, it sort of, yeah, that was it. It stole my soul. Yeah. It was quite a natural transition for me. Yeah, I thought, wow, this is, this is interesting, eh? This performance thing, you, you get to work with other people, you get to express yourself. My grandmother. You get to try new things all the time, and I thought, wow, this is the life for me. My river goes through the middle of my town, Tikawititanga, like this. Manga o Kiwa, my marae, it sits over here. Te toko ngā nui anoho, right by the railway tracks. My mum, she's down here on the flat. And me, I'm going to build a house right behind my mum. It's going to be shaped like this. I'm going to have a deck out the front with a ramp. I'm going to be able to look down the driveway to see who's coming. I'll have a big arch window over here to let the sun shine in. And over here, I'll have a special doorway just for my mum. And it'll be shaped like this. There's a there's a set another sequence where we've recorded himself asking himself questions. So what we wanted to do is try and create a version of, of his younger self, like when he was eight or younger. And that developed through him having a conversation with his younger self about what he's doing now. What are you doing there? 
Me, I am dancing in my wheelchair. Dancing? Yep. And hey, maybe they can't even see my wheelchair when I dance. Hey, do you, do you still have a girlfriend? Me? Oh, that's none of your business. Oh, do girls like people like that? They sure do. Oh, okay. How are you, bro? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Mum and Dad know you dance. Wow, it's funny you ask. I've been trying to work out how to tell them. Okay. Mm. So what shall I tell them? No, 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 no. I've been trying to work out how to tell them. I'll tell them. I'm going to tell them. No, 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 no. Don't do that, bro. I'll tell them, okay? I got it. in big trouble. So great work, everybody. Uh, let's go through the notes. More energy on your witty. Yeah, up, up a notch. Um, yeah, so I relocated to America in 2007 to dance for a company named Axis. Axis is renowned in the USA. They're made up with people with and without disabilities. Yeah, and I was with them for five years. They're located in Oakland, California. Yeah, and then how it ended up, I ended up on the street after being let go by Axis Dance Company. We obviously uh, didn't earn much, you know, you don't earn much in the arts world. world. It's driven by passion. So I'd, I, was unable, I was unable to accumulate funds, and so I uh, ended up with no funds. And I thought, well, my only option is, is to uh, go to the street. So while I was in San Francisco, I used to make use of the shelter system there. I got a 90-day bed. And in the morning, I wondered, whoo, I wonder what happens in the morning here. We had to get out of there by 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, if I wanted to make money, I'd just busk, you know. Well, I played harmonica. Yeah, I'd play harmonica or I'd play this game called Paradise. Paraplegic, dice of life. Dice for short, because that originally became my street name. The game would go like this. I'd get someone from the crowd, they'd come up, they'd roll out these three dice, and I'd have this board over here, and it had six wheelchair tricks on it that I could perform. You roll it out, three numbers, three trick combination. That's Kiwi Thunder. trying to live in this non-disabled world for a long time. I had lots of moments of anger and, and lost control. Like I, I would um, go through emotional states of jealousy when I had girlfriends and like that, because I would think, wow, I'm, you know, this disabled, non-disabled thing. Come up a lot in relationships like, um, it was because of age as well, because I was young and compared myself with other young men at that age, you know, and they're all vibrant, they're very athletic, and that I, I was limited to a degree and being athletic before my accident. So it would bring up this jealousy thing, and, and not so much jealousy that they're going to steal my lady or anything, but just jealousy around that, which sort of will get out of control sometimes. I would like to try and suppress it through alcohol and stuff like that, you know? I would like, yeah. I would distance myself from, from people. I returned home in 2015, May. Rediscovering what it is to be home. You know, what does home mean? Uh, how can I uh, participate and inject myself back into my family in a positive light? I've been waiting, like, you know, for me to return. And, and I can imagine, uh, like, having a son that's living homeless by choice. Yeah, it's sort of hard to wrap your head around, eh? Brother! 
Baruch. No, I know him. <laughs> yeah, well, he talked about uh, what it was like for them being home, you know, and, and drawing understanding to what I'm doing. What the hell is he doing over there? You now you see this going for a year, and 10 years later, limited communication. Um, I'm the one that went away, you know? Family one? remained. Come in, come in. Hey, girls, your uncle's here. Hi, darlings. Hi. So what you been up to today? Oh, nothing. You sure? <laughs> Nothing means a lot, you know. <laughs> Hard to do nothing. I might have had all these experiences and stuff like that, but so did they. You can either look at it like can compare or just sort of share the air and go, okay, where are we now? You know, how do we move forward now? I'm home and from what I've experienced, how can I best utilize that to support home? Man, I experienced 10 years over there and it's 10 years that I do regret some of it because of the time period, you know, the sacrifice, the time period away from family. But the, that's what you do, you know, when you pursue your career. You know, you sort of get caught up in this roller coaster of like trying to achieve and just grow within and, and deepen in your arts or your career or whatever that may be. So it's up to me to come in humbly and reconnect in a way that doesn't disrespect people. It's good to be home, bro. About time you came, mate. It's been a while. Time's the key to everything, really, I suppose, and it's the lock. Oh, you left us a bit stranded when you went away. Mm. Hey. Mm. Because that was not long after the old man passed away. Mm. You took off. I had to fly, bro. Nah, yeah, I thought you just wanted to get away. Mm. We missed you, though. Especially the nanny, and he missed you heaps. Every week. I wonder if Rodney's coming home. I wonder if Rodney's. And I keep telling you, I don't think he's ever coming back. He doesn't want to come back to Tikawiri. Yeah, I'm still trying to find how to be home, though, bro. It's going to take a while. I think it seems a little bit slower. You just got to move slower. Yeah, that's, yes, that's the key. I feel like um, just because I've been overseas and that doesn't mean that I know more than my brother that has six children, that his children, I love him to the max. He's been nowhere. Oh, you know, sure, he's been around the motu, around the country and that. And, and when I say nowhere, I say that respectfully because I've been overseas, you know, I have all these worldly experiences, but in comparison, he's a beautiful dad and he had to go nowhere. I'm living at Motel Tikawiri because I'm looking at getting a little unit built on the back of my mum's house, as my mum's home is a little bit inaccessible for me. Motel life, everybody thinks it's exciting, but you know, at the end of the day, I think it's all right for a night or two, but long term, it gets a little bit monotonous, and it looks like I'm going to be there a little bit, you know, for a while, for a chunk. I feel as time has moved on, you know, it's the cave has become smaller and smaller, this place, but yet again, all I have to do is push down the road and be at my mum's, you know, and they have no, like, uh, she has no hot water there, so I shower with cold water just out of respect for her. So this is the Papa Whenua where I'll be building my self-contained unit upon. It'll be a place of security, because I feel like I've been displaced for so long. 
And it's like, a, I don't call it homelessness, I call it, I've been home for. Well, I've been roaming on this earth for a long time, since I was 15 years old. So it's good to return home and have a place of um, stableness, but also a place that I can feel independent as well. Hi. Hey, oh, nice welcome, family. <laughs> Hi, bye. Hi, <laughs> They're a team of artists, hey, AV designers, hey, musicians, hey, to sort of do some research around uh, my story here in, in Tikwetitanga, how I grew up, come and look at my marae, go and visit my dad up the Uripa. I think them coming down and seeing where I grow up and, and getting an understanding from where these memories come from, what makes me strong, and getting a little visceral idea of what makes me. Kore te whanau. So I'm Rodney Bell, and I'm Seed of Chiefs, and I'll never forget that. I've been cloaked by many beautiful things in my life, and we're sitting in one of them, at my whare nui. Rodney's father and I are first cousins. We were grain pickers. Right up until uh, Rodney's father passed away, uh, he worked up there day in and day out. We really missed him when he passed. How's that terrain doing, Fanny? Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> Love it. Where are we going? Yeah. So did your dad see you dancing? No, I don't think he ever did. He used to go around town and everybody used to tell him about my dancing. And he'd just go, oh, yeah. Did you invite him? Yeah, I think I organised some sort of bus once. But maybe they all forgot to hop on it. <laughs> Yeah, so when I was homeless, I, I tried to carry like five backpacks with me and then realised, well, that's not possible. So I had to go down to like four, then three, then two, and eventually I ended up with just one. So I had to let go of a lot of stuff. What I kept in my final bed was mainly warm things because I knew it was going to get cold out there. But I did keep some treasures that I sort of carried around for a while. Like, I remember I had a necklace for my dad, I had a photo of my dad, stuff like that. I always said to myself that I couldn't show any signs of weakness because they're not fold, you know? So I knew I was on my own. I knew I had to fend for myself. Um, my nutrition, I, you know, that was all, everything was going to happen only because of me. No one else is going to help me, so why feel down about it? That was the facts, so I just, like, pursued it and formed it. I had high expectations of myself before my accident, you know? So after my accident, I sort of, yeah, I lost a little bit of hope in relationship to, like, all oh, right, well, I've got to start again. Always tried to keep on the up and up. Always tried to, like, um, make sure everyone else is OK. I 
I feel there's been um, this demon cloud of a disability, multiculture, homelessness, you know? They all get these demon clouds, they all get like stereotyped, oh, multiculture, oh man, they're lazy, they just do nothing. All this crap, disability, oh no, nah, they're deaf, they're in a wheelchair, you know? I just want to be part of that movement, or I am and part of that movement to push those cars aside, you know, give some hope. And obviously I was told, you're disabled, you know, you're not gonna be able to do this, 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 this. And it's like, that can find you straight away, right? Okay, I'm not gonna be able to do those things. Cool. What am I gonna be able to do, eh? I can disagree. <laughs> I can uh, just not turn up and do your OT thing, you know what I mean? I can um, go against the grain and try dancing, you know? I think it's about choice, choice and control. I'm still wanting to hone in and challenge this idea of disabled dancer, because obviously it's obvious, right? I have a disability. I get on stage, a lot of people come up to me and go, oh, I didn't even see your wheelchair. And I think to myself, okay, what are they trying to say? No, they're just trying to say, wow, that was a beautiful performance. Why not just say that, you know? Why not just say that? Why do you always have to refer to the chair? Just be accepted as a uh, performer, you know? Without the pity, without the empathy. It's great to be acknowledged for what you do, hey. Brings great pride. Attitude was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.